Okay, I think we'll start. Um, sorry for the delay there. I'm using a new uh, camera, a new system, new computer, so it looks a little different. I just want to make sure everything is working. I guess we'll find out. But uh, welcome you into our midweek study. And I'm excited to continue in our study of First John chapter four here in a moment. Um, for you Lancaster folks, um, it was announced this last Sunday that uh, maybe in a few weeks um, we might be back on Wednesday night in the building for Bible study. If that's the case, we'll uh, we will adjust our what we're doing as far as broadcasting on Wednesday night. Uh, but <clears throat> don't have all the details on that yet. I'll let you know as soon as I can. Uh, but I think by that time, we'll be done with this particular study we've been in. So that part will work out okay. But I uh, hope you're doing well. And we're in, uh, as I said, First John 4. This study entitled Testing the Spirits, really based on the language of 1 John 4, that, that title there. And I thought we'd just begin by reading our text once more, because um, we're really working out of that very closely. So 1 John 4, verses 1 through 8, maybe by this time you almost have it memorized. It says, Beloved... <clears throat> Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Okay, so um, we're taking our study from really the command of the first verse there. Don't believe every spirit. And when, you know, when, when it says spirit, we're to think uh, teaching, teacher, um, truth claim, whatever it might be. Don't believe every individual or, or church or uh, teacher who claims to say something from God, but test them, test the spirits to see whether they really are from God. And then he says, because you know many false prophets have gone out into the world. Okay. So then John goes on and gives us five tests, at least in, in those eight verses, that are very practical and easy to apply. And we've just been working through them one by one um, and trying to understand how to apply them when we face a situation of how, having to discern teachings or teachers uh, that present themselves to us. So test number one, which we talked about a couple weeks ago, was does the spirit, the teacher, the person, the church, whatever, does it teach the true Jesus? This test uh, comes from verses two and three. Uh, sometimes what people say about Jesus reveals that they aren't really of Jesus. And so does it teach the true Jesus? John's particular concern at the time was that there were people saying Jesus didn't really come in the flesh. He wasn't really a man. He appeared to be, but he wasn't. 
And John says that disqualifies them. You shouldn't listen to them because they're not teaching the true Jesus. There might be some other kind of false teaching about Jesus today, uh, but that's step number one, test number one. Test number two comes out of verses four and five, which is, uh, is it against worldliness? Does the, the spirit, the teaching, the teacher, the church, um, take a stand against worldliness or not? Uh, and then test number three, which is what we want to focus on this evening, I had uh, suggested earlier maybe we would do three and four, but I think we'll just get three tonight. Test number three comes out of verse six of the text, and that is, uh, we'll say it this way, does the spirit, the teaching, the teacher, the church, whatever, does it uphold God's word? Does it uphold God's word? So again, verse six says, John writes, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So, um, <clears throat> To understand um, the point here, I think we we have to think about who who authorized or who, who was the author of New Testament scripture. Okay, let's think about that question for a minute. Uh, was it the Holy Spirit? Well, of course, the answer to that is yes. The Holy Spirit. Um, in a sense, is the author of the New Testament, Old Testament as well, but we're focusing on this text in the New Testament. Um, and um, just to refresh our background for that view, in 2 Peter chapter 1, which we're going to keep referring back to tonight, um, in verses 20 and 21 of 2 Peter 1, uh, the apostle says, Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So uh, there's a direct link between the Holy Spirit and the authorship of, of Scripture, New Testament Scripture in particular in this case. So if we were to say, in answer to the question, who authored the New Testament, the Holy Spirit, um, that's correct, all right? Working through uh, people that he carried along, that he uh, moved to write. If um, we answered that question, who authored New Testament Scripture, if we said, well, certain individuals, that would be correct as well. Um, in particular, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ are the authors of the New Testament or those that were closely associated with the apostles. Uh, there are some New Testament writers that weren't apostles, but they were closely linked with. So, for instance, uh, Luke. Uh, but in general, it, you know, New Testament comes from the apostles. And uh, a passage, again, in 2 Peter that's important here is in 2 Peter chapter 3, and uh, right toward the end of that letter, verses 15 and 16. Let's uh, hear those this evening, so I think it really ties in with what we're discussing. Peter writes again, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Now, there's several things in those two verses that are important to us, I think, in, in what we're looking at. Um, first, notice uh, that Peter, the writer, is referring to another New Testament writer. Uh, Peter, the apostle, referring to another apostle. Uh, 
the Apostle Paul. Okay, and he says that Paul wrote there in, in verse 16. In fact, he, he says Paul wrote to you, speaking to his audience at the time. So Paul wrote, and then he wrote according to the wisdom given him. Um, and the wisdom, of course, is, is coming from God through the Holy Spirit. So Paul wrote according to the wisdom given him. It wasn't just something that he came up with. Uh, he had an idea one day to write a New Testament book. No, it was according to wisdom given him by God. And he was moved by God to do so. Also notice that Peter calls what Paul wrote scripture. Um, when he talks about how some people twist them, twist um, these writings, he refers to the writings of Paul as scriptures right at the end of verse 16. He claims, Peter, the inspired apostle, claims Paul wrote scripture. So uh, the New Testament is scripture, just like the Old Testament. And then also he, he, he mentions, of course, that the scriptures sometimes get twisted by ignorant and unstable people. They, he says, you know, sometimes the things in scripture are hard to understand, and sometimes they get, they're made more difficult to understand because some twist them, and he calls people who would twist them ignorant and unstable in this particular translation, the ESV. And, and these, of course, are, are the false teachers that Peter's concerned about, that Paul is concerned about, and that John, uh, the writer of our main passage, is concerned about all throughout his writings. So if we go back to 1 John 4, verse 6, and um, in particular this third test that, that John gives us to make it possible for us to test the spirits, Think about who John is. John is an apostle. He has authority from God. Um, really, after the Lord Jesus, he has sort of unmatched authority in the history of the church, John and all the apostles. Apostles had unique authority. And this comes from God um, by way of the Holy Spirit. And so John says... In this third test, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So those who accept John's teaching, his, his preaching, his writing, like here in 1 John, uh, they accept God. They accept the Holy Spirit. Those who accept John, it's as good as from God because John is inspired by God, inspired by the Spirit. On the other hand, those who reject him, and we, we must imagine that there were uh, several that were rejecting his teaching at the time, or he probably wouldn't have written this. Those who reject him reject God, reject the Holy Spirit because his teaching is from God. And so that person who rejects him, who rejects John as an apostle, uh, is a false spirit, a false teacher, a false prophet that John's warning about all along. Okay, So you sort of see how this test works. And, and we extend it out to, to now our time. John's writing in a time where they don't have all the New Testament books. Now we've got the full New Testament. We extend it out out to our time, and we, we say in general, uh, does the spirit, the teacher, the church uphold God's word? Does it support God's word? Uh, because um, these words are from God, inspired by God. That's an important test. Just like, do they tell the truth about Jesus? And um, do they... Uh, reject worldliness, test number two, and now um, do they uphold God's word 
all of them very important. And so again, as we think about applying it today, the same is true. Those, those who accept scripture, who uphold the Bible, accept God and vice versa. You know, those who reject scripture and um, undermine the Bible, question its authority, suggest things about it that you know, maybe we shouldn't really uh, accept what it says. They, they reject God. I want you to listen to something else from, from Peter along these lines. If we go back to 2 Peter, I mentioned that that is going to be an important passage for us tonight. 2 Peter chapter 1 and um, verses 16 and following. 2 Peter 1, verse 16 and following. Peter's going to talk about something that he got to be an eyewitness of during the life of Jesus. Um, he begins by saying, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. So what's Peter referring to? What event is he referring to here? Uh, I'm sure you remember the story of Jesus' transfiguration. He goes up on the mountain with three of the disciples and uh, um, he, he is transfigured, he, he shines brightly, and, uh, and Peter says, we saw this glorification of the Lord with our own eyes. It was an incredible experience for these guys, as we can imagine, uh, as, as Jesus appears um, on the mountain in glory. But he says, and this is the reason I bring this up tonight, that there is something even better than such an experience. He had this incredible experience, but he says there's something even more, uh, even greater, all right? Verse 19, after he describes his experience up on the mountain, he says, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. Uh, some translations say more sure. We might translate it more reliable, more verified, more well-founded. He says we have the prophetic word. He's, he's talking about the word of God. So Peter has this incredible visual, physical experience where he sees Jesus in his glory, transfigured on the mountain. And he relates that experience to his readers here in 2 Peter 1. But in the very next phrase, he says, there's something even greater than that. There's something that's more reliable, more well-documented, more verified. What is it? It's the prophetic word that is the word of God. That's even more impressive. See, according to Peter, the inspired apostle who walked and talked with Jesus for three, three and a half years, who saw him transfigured on the mountain, who, who saw him raised from the tomb. All those things he got to experience with his own eyes, touch with his own hands. He says there's something even greater, more sure more reliable, and that is the prophetic word, the word of God. Now, that's a pretty impressive statement, if you think about it. 
And the reason um, that it's that's greater is because it's directly from God. It's more than just something, uh, an experience that somebody had. And uh, we know that he's referring to the word of God when he says the prophetic word, because you just go on, and we already read the last two verses of that chapter, where he says no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. So he's talking about scripture when he makes this statement. I just think that's a really important Point because so many who claim to be bringing truth from God today suggest, um, you know, that that experience that they've had some kind of experience or revelation, and um, sometimes that contradicts the Word of God. Peter says the Word of God is more reliable than experience and those kinds of things. Uh, this test, this third test, is important because false spirits, false teachers often disparage or di distract from or detract from God's word in order to, to elevate their own view, whatever it might be. Um, and, and John says no true spirit will do that this you know, no true spirit will fail this test no true teacher when we uphold god's word you see we uphold god himself because it's from him and he ensured it and made sure it uh, was what he claimed it to be when we submit to god's word we submit to god and so test number three, again, does it, does the, the spirit, the teacher, the teaching, the church, does it uphold the word of God like it should? Never forget that uh, the scripture closes with a very solemn warning. If you go to the last page of the Bible, okay, <clears throat> obviously Revelation. Last chapter, chapter 22, verse 18, right before uh, John, who also wrote the book of Revelation, right before he signs off uh, by saying, the grace of the Lord be with you all, amen. What's he say just before that? He says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. Now listen. What's the warning? If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. So you have this very serious warning at the close of scripture. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Why would we if it's from God? Are we going to argue with God about what he says? Some do. Um, and that, that is a failure of this third test. Does it uphold the word of God? Uh, and so that's, that goes right along with those first two. Um, the, four, the, the fourth test that we'll look at next time it's going to sound, at least in its title, very, very much like this one. And um, let's see how we exactly worded it. Test number four also comes out of verse six. Um, and that is, does it promote truth? Um, we'll see how there's a little bit of a distinction there between number three and four, because there is. But does it promote truth? Uh, where John says there at the end, uh, this is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So uh, that's where we'll, we'll finish up for tonight. I didn't quite have enough time to go into that fourth one, but we'll cover that next time. Hope you're benefiting from this and keeping these things in mind as you evaluate teachers, uh, including me.
and anybody else who claims to speak a word from God's word. And you can see how important number three is. Does it really support and uphold God's word? Let's, let's have a word of prayer before we finish tonight. Our God, we want to believe and obey your word. We want to say the right things about Jesus. We want to take a stand against worldliness. And we want to uphold truth because we know all those things are important to you. And you've called us and commanded us to do it. Please help us to do so faithfully and to do so in love. Pray your blessings on all those who are part of our study, all those out there who really need your help and care right now. Thank you for caring for us and loving us. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior. We come to you in his name. Amen.